Yes, we can see. We can see your first slide. Very good. Yeah, so then thank you very much again for having me here today uh, for this fantastic seminar series. And it's my big pleasure today to contribute uh, a talk about the sustainability of, of metals. And I do this with a couple of great colleagues together and I will highlight their contributions as, as we walk through the presentation. And um, the main assignment, I think, of the, of the overview talk is, is clear. We, we want to identify pathways for particularly the reduction of the energy consumption and CO2 footprint. And we do that, I think, all our professional lives, of course, I would say in an indirect way, through providing advanced materials. Uh, those are, for instance, uh, very high strength materials in order to reduce the weight of cars, and magnetic materials uh, to propel electrical vehicles and particularly high temperature materials to improve canoe efficiency and so on. But as we will see during the talk, a very high CO2 footprint comes of course from the primary synthesis of materials. And that, that affects really practically all materials, both rare earths, but also iron ores, copper, lithium and so on. And in that ballpark also scrap plays a very big role when we want to go circular. So by the sheer numbers, we know that metals have been one of the big troublemakers uh, at a gigantic scale as, scale, as you will see in a minute. But I try to hope to share today with you some ideas how we can you know, be part of the solution in the next years. What I find particularly really exciting and very motivating in this, in this region, in this topic, is that we have an entanglement of a set of interconnected topics. So we, we want to really target a circular production. And that includes, of course, a reduced CO2 footprint of our production methods, the use of green energy, electrification, digitalization, so meaning efficiency measures, and of course, use of buffer energy such as hydrogen. And that, that shows us that these topics are obviously interconnected, that sustainability is a system science, which again brings metallurgists in a good position. So I sometimes feel we are catapulted from the Iron and Bronze Age into the modern age of sustainability. But let me walk a little bit through this basic idea, through this promise uh, of the circular economy in uh, pertaining to material science. So let's start again first with a thought about the role of artificial intelligence and digital measures uh, in our field. Uh, and I think they play a vital role because efficiency improvement is still one of the most important sustainability measures. And, and these techniques have only been started to be unleashed. Second is materials for electrification. I mentioned already magnetic materials, for instance, for electrical cars. Next is all the material solutions that you in part know very well, for instance, for solar cell absorbers, uh, for the design of advanced uh, windmill power plants, but also for the electrical conductors. A very big portion, namely up to three and a half percent of the gross domestic product can be saved by simply enhancing materials longevity. In other words, corrosion protection and materials for a hydrogen economy that withstand hydrogen embrittlement. And the more you know, future thought is can we build in the gene of recycling, the scrap compatibility into the design of new materials. But in all these measures, we must not forget that the markets are growing so quickly that you always will have, even in the best of all worlds, a certain fraction that must be covered by primary synthesis. So in the best of all worlds and the best project we will deal with only two thirds about of the materials that we can deal with in a, in a completely circular sense. And due to the market growth, at least one third will come from primary synthesis. And those are the sources where essentially the CO2 comes from, from silicon to iron to aluminum. And let me reflect a little bit on these acceleration factors. So it is often said that the population is the main driver, which is of course true. But as you see from this uh, overproportional increase, uh, the main proportionality between the CO2 emission and population comes through the GDP increase. That means, in other words, uh, the economic well-being of the population is the main driver of CO2 emissions, while the carbon intensity and energy intensity, as you see here, has actually become better in industry, not worse. Another big driver not to forget this in, in metallurgy and CO2 footprint is simply uh, the sustainability technologies in themselves. Let us just quickly look at this three megawatt turbine as a simple example, as a textbook example. Uh, and we know how gigantic these machines meanwhile are, 
And you see the enormous amounts for this type of design of concrete, of steel, of copper, but also aluminum, rare earth for the magnetic path and so on. You have a huge consumption of materials. The same applies for the other green technologies if you want, uh, namely solar cells or the electrification of the transport that already mentioned. Then you see just here as a snapshot, the high variety of elements that we are consuming when we realize these types of green technologies. This is something where we have to consider as an acceleration factor. And above all is, of course, the consumption of steel. Um, and that goes what we sometimes maybe tend to forget in Europe still massively into the global infrastructure. 50, more than 50% of the world's steel really still goes into construction. So these are really, really uh, staggering and gigantic numbers. And you will later see how this translates to CO2. In a worst case scenario, uh, when the global warming goes on like it currently does, then we need to start protecting our coastal regions as we know it from London, Venice or, or Rotterdam. And that again is a factor that will propel uh, the, the consumption of materials. So we talk about gigantic amounts of sand, gravel, concrete, and of course steel. So when I cast this in this little overview diagram, I would talk about, I would talk about five acceleration factors in the materials market, population, GDP, the realization of green energy technologies, infrastructures, and at the end, coastal protection. And that translates into the staggering increase in the consumption of raw materials. We, we don't drop this consumption, but this is accelerating drastically. So you see from the latest OECD numbers that things like iron ores or copper ores will more than double in their consumption by 2060. That means it is more than urgent to really deal with the sustainability of these resources. And it must also be emphasized that it's not just the energy uh, and CO2 footprint, but we have many, many more categories that enter into the total estimate ballpark of how sustainable, not sustainable, our metallurgical sectors are, including land, assets, the use of water, uh, the emissions of other greenhouse gases, of course, and how it affects uh, land use and food. Another aspect that is sometimes forgotten is also the scarcity. So the sheer question of availability. This is a nice diagram, um, which shows in a distorted way, reflecting the abundance of these materials. And we, of course, know that elements like iron, aluminum, and silicon are vastly around. That means there's no big limit, as you see, there's plentiful supply, supply. But many of the really critical elements, particularly for green technologies, are often those that are not so vastly available. So it's a matter of scarcity. And when you take these nice data, data from uh, Reck and Gradle's nice paper, uh, where they estimated the end of life recycling rate. So how much do we get back after these materials have already been in use? And you see particularly elements that are so critical for the electrification, for instance, uh, like um, neodym or samarium uh, for making magnets have a recycling rate below 1%. So it's really a dramatic you know, uh, discrepancy here. So the punchline is, how do we tame about 2 billion tons of metals that we produce every year. So this is really the, the key question which we are suddenly thrown into. And we all know how this translates in the consequences. Um, we talk about more than 8% of the total global energy consumption in our field. We dig more than 2.5 billion tons of ores out of the earth every year. We all know uh, from the side of, uh, of aluminum ore and iron ore what consequences that has also for the, for the local environments where it comes from. And we talk about about a third of all industrial greenhouse gas emissions. The good message is, of course, that even if we have tiny ideas, tiny measures from science and engineering, they can have a really, really big effect. And that makes it such an exciting topic. We must always remember that sustainability must be quantified, because otherwise, I think we hear too much blah, blah of good ideas which are not properly quantified. Let me demonstrate that with a nice example out of Mike Ashby's book, where we talk aluminum cans with a global 75% recycling rate, already a pretty good product, as we all know. We know the staggering numbers of aluminum can consumption uh, every year and every second, essentially. And you break this down just as a simple life cycle assessment example into the resource consumption, the emission inventory, and the impact assessment. And it's often as you know, not so easy to get a hand on all these detailed data, but that's what you need. And partly you have to pay a lot of money for getting the data. 
So then you quantify that uh, in, in unit and, and kilograms or whatever of your consumption, both regarding resource consumption, but also emissions inventory. And then you translate this into the impact assessment. And then you can see when we stay for, with the field of aluminum cans, that this gives you a huge variety. And the worst case where you, you know, use only fossil power, you uh, use less than half of the cans uh, from recycling. That is a worst case scenario with a very high carbon footprint, as opposed to the best possible solution where you do not only have a high recycling input content to the melt and a nice low melting point of aluminum, of course, plus a high recycling rate after its use. And for the rest of the primary uh, aluminum, you use uh, green power supplies. And that gives you more than a factor of 10 discrepancy in the carbon uh, footprint. So that is how you really must start quantifying these things, because otherwise I think we are a little bit lame in our description. So we must simply learn to do that properly. So we all teach our students that, of course, when we provide mechanical materials to like chassis or whatever, we need to quantify all the mechanical data. That's how many of us spend their professional life, giving yield strengths, forming limits, ductility, and so on. On top of that, of course, we need to quantify all the functional data from corrosion, longevity, but also haptics and damping. But on top of that, we are now thrown already in a customer situation where you must start to quantify, say, these green or sustainability footprint ID numbers. And that is coming like, I think, with a very, very strong wave that your customers downstream want to know that. And that must be part of our curriculum also. So we must be careful in the unintended consequences. I, I, I like this picture as a, as a simple demonstrator. That is, of course, not the point to, to at the end of the day, just scrap these green technologies without you know, making it necessary that these technologies themselves must be also sustainable. The fact that they provide green energy, for instance, does not mean they are free from the constraint of being sustainable in themselves. That means there must be holistic circles and the circular economy that includes, of course, the green technologies. Otherwise, you know, you don't have really a close solution. One example that I find sometimes interesting and worse to be discussed are, of course, car batteries. We all know that. Everybody says these are lithium batteries. We all know, no, they are not lithium batteries. They are lithium cobalt batteries and they are lithium cobalt titanium batteries and so on. They are complex compounds. And we talk in an average electrical vehicle up to 10 kilogram of cobalt. And as metallurgists, we all know what that means. 70% of the world's cobalt comes from Katanga and the, the, uh, uh, the labor measures and the environmental measures that are implemented there are really absolutely not living up to the standards we expect. So again, there's a part missing in this holistic picture. The same applies to the uh, harvesting of the manganese noils now from the deep sea. We talk four kilometer, five kilometer deep sea level depths. And it's of course price driven by the nickel price, by the copper price and so on, by the cobalt price. So it's becoming affordable. And when we need 1 billion electric vehicles on the street by 2050, it's one of the targets we must say where this material comes from. So, and that is like one deep sea creature that you would affect uh, when you start doing this. And again, I'm not criticizing, I'm just saying we must also extend the understanding of what we are doing to these new technologies also. Um, another very interesting aspect in that very sense of pressures of retrieving precious and expensive metals is of course, urban mining. And I like this example very much because I think there's incredibly much to do. When we now go to the best gold mines in South Africa, you get about one kilogram of gold from about 200 tons of ore. So that is about the relation. When you do the same thing uh, from mobile phones, from the chips of mobile phones, we need only about three or four tons of scrapped mobile phones to get the same amount of gold. That is already now a growing industry standard. But we throw away about 50 billion euros of worth of electrical waste every year on the planet today without subjecting it in any way to such a circle. And we all know most of that ends again as landfill and uh, where uh, poor populations have to try at least to get a minimum of the copper back with very simple and, and poison standards. That currently we, we talk about a projection of 18 billion mobile devices by 2024. So it's around the corner from which 75% are not at all collected. And if we do so, less than 20% is recycled. So there's a lot to do in hydrometallurgy of getting in standard electrochemistry all this material back. 
Now, back to the structural alloys. I already mentioned these gigantic numbers of steel simply driven by the gigantic amount of production of uh, about 1.85 billion tons of uh, steel per year. And aluminum is, of course, uh, scaling less, but also is a big contributor in the CO2 emissions. Another point is the material scrap in manufacturing. And these numbers are particularly high for aluminum titanium, owing to the fact that you often carve the products out by simply by a lot of, of chipping the material. And that simply means that during the manufacturing, you lose a lot of the original value of the material. When you take the more dirty route of aluminum synthesis, primary synthesis, and it is uh, in some countries done, it depends very much on, on where you do that. But if you don't use sustainable energy supply, you talk 16.5 ton CO2 production per ton of aluminum and comparably low 2.3 ton CO2 per ton iron in a currently operating integrated blast furnace based steel factory. That's still pretty high, uh, but much lower than aluminum. The point, however, is that the total quantity, of course, of iron is much higher. Now you could say regarding the chipping and scrapping that additive manufacturing would solve all the problems. But we know that is not true because simply the massive need for material production rates cannot really keep up by just doing it additive. So we discuss the sustainability of materials maybe along two directions. One is the direct avoidance of CO2 and energy waste. And we call that direct sustainability measures, while the other measures would be indirect. That means they help saving energy through lightweight uh, or magnetic materials, for instance. Let me give a couple of more specific examples, and we will come back to them later in more scientific detail. Obviously, uh, you would first go for CO2 reduced production, not only for steel reduction, but also for silicon reduction for many other materials which you produce in a very similar way. We try to use carbon free reduction carriers, electrification of everything you can do when you can directly use a green uh, energy supply. In some cases, you must buffer by, by hydrogen, of course, that is electrolysis plus more ion conducting reduction. Recycling plays a very big role, particularly in the field of steel and aluminum, of course, and titanium too. Process efficiency, I mentioned that there are many, many fields where you can still gain from that. And you all know these indirect sustainability measures, of course, where you see things like weight reduction in transportation, uh, always maintaining, of course, the safety of the things you do, product longevity, corrosion being one of the most important fields in, in sustainability research, damage tolerance, repairability, but also energy conversion, higher efficiency. You see that in the next example, when I come back to the fact that we all must still must push the Carnot efficiency and get to higher conversion temperatures, but also materials with lower resistivity and materials for energy harvesting. Now, this is an overview diagram that I plotted after an example, inspiring example from Mike Ashby's book. We start from the primary energy source, be it oil, gas, or what have you, you need often corrosion and hydrogen resistant alloys as an indirect tool. Then you go through the biggest pot through the energy conversion into electrical energy. And that's what I meant, where you need for higher control efficiency, you still must do more intense research on high temperature alloys or high temperature coatings. And that would include also fueling hydrogen or ammonia or methanol into these turbines. So mixed turbine atmospheres would come. And then you need strong, lightweight, low resistive conductors. You need low tribology, high strength alloys at the machines where you use it at so on, and magnetic alloys, of course, for the transformers. Um, but, but the main point from this little diagram is that you often have a total like 90% energy loss during that conversion, but still the biggest amount is in these classical Carnot cycles. That means it's still very important to always think about how can you improve the energy conversion in power plants. Uh, the good news is when we look into the different uh, categories, um, the different sectors, household, transport, industry, and energy, the good thing here is that many of these categories can drastically affect it by using these better materials. That means when we pull this together, we have more than 80% that can be influenced by progress in material science and engineering. That's good for our field. When you think of the Eiffel Tower, and you know this example, of course, if it were built today, it would require 75% less steel for exactly the same design. Or here's a nice study from AMG uh, for a, a body in white without the hang-on parts uh, carrying 270 kilograms. And that is very low because we all know the cars currently are still too heavy 
they're all forever. You see that in this little overview diagram and you have seen many of these diagrams before. And we know particularly the high price cars and the electrical vehicles that are coming are insanely heavy. And there's no excuse. There's a still that every little penny is negotiated. We know the total cost of the body and white of a car is not very high. It's definitely not high. Uh, these are some numbers from the first Alpine that I got from their webpage where they state they talk for a, for a kind of green product, green steel product in the future, 150 to 200 euros more price per ton of car, which, which is lousy. That is not very high for a washing machine. It's even only a few euros. Most of that anyway comes from electric arc furnaces already. Uh, so the vision that I would have for the future is that we have, have a two-step approach to, to marketing these types of things. The first is that we simply must much more efficiently and clearly use high performance materials. That means we replace commodity materials by high strength steels, by high strength aluminum, by magnesium and so on. And the same second thing is that these primary and secondary synthesis forms must have a lower CO2 uh, fingerprint. And that means then you sell to your customers two type of advantages, lower mass, lower weight when in use and a lower carbon and energy footprint from the primary production of these types of products. So that gives us, I think, a, a staggered two-stage approach where we really must think of our products much more holistic than we did before, including the mechanical properties and including the sustainability properties. I already mentioned, and of course, don't go deeper into that. Other people are much better in this field um, that alone five tons of steels are lost every second just due to corrosion. And that also explains why this sometimes connotated thought of a completely circular economy would, would never work because many of our materials, steels and aluminum and, and, and nickel products are very, very sustainable already. That means when you see from this distribution, many of the products would enter the scrap market after more than 100 years. You see one of the oldest products is the Brooklyn Bridge. It's 150 years old. And that means you don't scrap get that scrap material from buildings back so readily. Some products like packaging come back quickly into the scrap cycle, but you cannot build with the growth factors I explained before a completely circular economy that's not working because the materials are already pretty good in, in being uh, having a, a long life. The, the good thing is, on the other hand, we have, of course, a lot of money coming from this market. The global market for materials exceeds 3,000 billion every year. This is gigantic. And our question is not only how we can turn it uh, circular and sustainable, but for us, of course, we want to know what is a basic research assignment. What is more something that companies can do better and what can researchers do better? So the thing is here that we have more than 40,000 papers every year now about climate change. I just only took the scope of source. We have really quality controlled publications. And that is good. That is an important topic. We must do research about it. When you however look into the publications that pertain to solving the CO2 emissions, the number is very small. When you look into scrap recycling or sustainable ecology, the number of publications in these fields is, is really surprisingly small. That means we, we, we do not talk, I think, enough about how to solve their problems. And, and I feel there's a lots, lots of room, headroom and urgency, of course, for doing really fundamental research in this field. And let's go a little bit deeper into steel when we read the notes of Bill Gates, if you want to do that. Then he has a nice, nice question. What's your plan for steel? As his first question to keep global warming in check. And I think let's try to answer Mr. Gates that question. So the basic redox equation, sorry for the typo here, uh, the redox equation is that you reduce hematite by carbon monoxide, and that creates uh, the stoichiometry for the CO2 emissions. That equations in blast furnace are more complicated, of course. And we have the growth factors that we already mentioned. So we talk 2.8 billion tons about by 2050. So that problem is not going away, but it's becoming intense, more intense every minute and every day. And iron steel alone stands for more than 7% of this total budget that I gave you before of all global CO2 emissions. So there's no more urgent problem than dealing with iron steel production. So what does the basic thermodynamics tell, tell you? You just look up the you know, energy of oxidation and that would tell you we talk about six megajoule per kilogram is the free energy of oxidation of iron into hematite, which is also the mostly used uh, oxide. That means that is really the embodied energy. When you really look at the current efficiency, which is in iron steel already very, very good, we talk 18 to 25 
uh, megajoule per kilogram. For many other metals, that rate is much, much smaller, by the way, just to not forget that. So in many aggregates, you are pretty close to the uh, efficiency optimum. And that means you must go to other reductant means like, for instance, hydrogen, ammonia, or even other substances we talk about. Now let's look at the bigger picture, the bigger map here. So we have raw feedstock that can be scrap, mixed scrap, lump ores of all kinds of chemistry, not to forget, and fines. Now you can, as reductants, you can bring them in an aggregate state as protons, ions, electrons, and molecules. So you have a vast array in, in, in which physical state you can bring these uh, redox partners together. And the carriers can be you know, from LOHC, which stands for liquid only hydrogen carriers, to hydrogen, ammonia, methane, or methanol, whatever cyclic products you can identify with their respective stoichiometric uh, footprint. So that gives you a huge array of combinations. And you must, of course, consider where, when you use ammonia or hydrogen or methane, where does it come from? Or LOHC, of course. Does it come from Harbor Bosch, from steam reforming, from pyrolysis, where you produce solid carbon, which I find is not so bad? Or does it come from water splitting, which is still relatively moderate efficiency rates? So that gives you one picture, part of the picture, to calculate the complete efficiency. So again, the problem should not only look good, but you must quantify it. And then you must look at the energy sources, how these processes are driven that provide you with the renewable reductants. So there's a complete picture of doing a life cycle assessment about which numbers we really talk. And I go a little bit deeper into this, what you all know, the different varieties that you have here, the current processing route of integrated steel making um, and a couple of varieties, variants of that. So let's first talk about direct reduction. We follow in principle something like a Medex picture. Uh, but do it now uh, with hydrogen, with pure hydrogen. And we take classical direct reduction pellets that you would uh, typically use in a, in a classical direction uh, like Midrex type of plant. So it means you expose these pellets typically to methane. We expose them, of course, to hydrogen. And some companies are already, of course, going into that. Again, depending on the calculation items I told you before, you have 0.3 to 0.6 tons of CO2 for that. At the end of the day, don't forget, you must melt the iron sponge that you get from the direct reduction. It means you must go to something like an electric arc furnace and, of course, secondary level metallurgy anyway. Now, let us look at the kinase. I just only plot here one set of data, the 700 degree uh, hydrogen curve, and you find that in many preceding papers also very nicely uh, discussed over the past decades. What you see is interesting when you look at the reduction rates that the transition from the hematite to magnetite is very fast, but wustite reduction to iron at 700 is extremely sluggish and gets slower all the time. Now, here's a very nice uh, little uh, environmental electron microscopy movie made for my colleague, Professor Mark Willinger at ETH in Zurich, with whom we collaborate on this. So he exposed a little wustite single crystal sample that we sent him after characterization. And you see how that film of the smooth iron is starting to cover this, this rough appearing oxide. So this is a classical picture that you see in the last stage of the direct reduction with hydrogen. You have this rough appearing wustite, which is a very stable, very rigid oxygen carrier structure. And in order to reduce it, the oxygen must diffuse through that very dense iron layer where it then can recombine into water. So that makes this, uh, this very slow diffusion coefficient of oxygen through the iron layer makes it so very slow. But we can show when we look into the microscopy of direct reduction, that is simply not true because the structure is by no means so dense as this classical core shell picture would convey to you, but it's much, much more complex. And why is that? So you have a very complex uh, sequence of phase transformation, as you, as you all know, from the magnetite, uh, sorry, from the hematite, the sexual structure, to the cubic magnetite, which is an inverse spinel, from magnetite to wustite, which is also cubic, and further down to ferret, of course, depending on uh, uh, which temperature you operate. And all those have a very big mass deficit and a volume deficit. That means you have huge stresses that you build up with cracks, delamination. And when you look into this uh, picture with the electron channeling contrast image here, picture number E, then you can also see that you build up vast arrays of geometric and necessary dislocations close to that interface because of this uh, volume mismatch. And you have a massive development of porosity and of cracks where the water can be formed, where the oxygen can arrive at these internal interfaces to form water, 
only up to a certain pressure level, however, as you, as you see in a minute uh, from a theoretical treatment. So the punchline take home message here is that the real reduction microstructure is much, much uh, more complex as you, as you see here. So the, the, here you see a section through such a little pellet, direct regression pellet, you see a huge gradient between the surface and the center. That means these pellets do not, uh, of course, reduce homogeneously. And that gives you also information about the future design uh, uh, of, of such pellets and, and how you should compact them, how poor should they, uh, should they be, and, and when they should fracture. When you track that here, only plotted in terms of the porosity over the reduction time, and we stay here again at 700 degree centigrade, then you see that porosity is massively growing, but also changing in, in percolation and in, in the size distribution as a function of the reduction time. And that plays a very important role, as we see, for controlling and improving the kinetics, because you want to have a fast process and not a slow process. The industrial processes would more likely end somewhere around 900 degrees centigrade, but here we made it a bit slower to better track these processes. Now we cut here such a pellet open. Again, that is a commercial pellet. We work both with single crystal and commercial polycrystalline pellets. You can do the EBSD, as you see, or the phase analysis. You can look at all the grain boundaries to see where are maybe the first uh, nucleation centers uh, for the phase transformations. And then you can try to also subject all of that into a boundary condition treatment. So what I mean by that is that we develop a, a, a modified phase field theory based on the Allen Kahn type of approach. That means we work with non-conserved variables under a complete redox reaction cycle. That means we can take a patch of that microstructure and subject it to a hydrogen reduction, as you see here. And then you can track in detail, however, here without the fracture mechanics that is still under implementation, but you can see where the oxygen is going to, where the water is formed, and particularly how fast the progress in iron formation takes place. So this is still all work under progress. This is just a little bit to show you how much open, nice, also theory questions are, are available in this field to do thermodynamics, to look into the effect of chemistry, into the size effects, and so on. So we try also, again, in a nice collaboration with the ETH in Zurich that is done by Malte Eric Beer, uh, to do this in a two-dimensional environment, uh, environmental microscope, where we use quasi two-dimensional Wüstite thin film. So you see that here, and I zoom a little bit through this microstructure. And you can see here the emergence, uh, again, at 700 degree of these little iron nuclei inside of the electron microscope, where you can track them and see under which geometrical constraints they are formed and how transport works. Now, that, here we go to a much higher resolution now. We do high angle angular dark field imaging. We do that. That is a nice measurement from red zone done together with my colleagues in Professor Dame's department, with Christian Liebschers and others. Uh, groups together where we do electron tomography to understand the environment of individual pores or damage features that we have seen before in a three-dimensional analysis method. And you see the grain boundaries and you can, by diffraction, then also start to identify what kind of phases and what sequence of phases you have. You can even study the stresses locally. This is just a little snapshot of reminding us that you go through a complex sequence of phase transformations. And then you do that again in different regions of such a single crystal close to the surface in the middle or far away from the surface. And when you are far away from the surface, you see that you have around the closed pores, as I show here, you have really a reoxidation from the already reduced iron back to Wüstite because the water recombination pressure has become so high locally. And we go further down also to the atomistic scale and look at the effects of chemistry. You have a lot of gang tramp related elements that form very rigid oxides that you don't reduce at all. And those particularly pertain to magnesium, titanium, and so on and others that influence in part, depending on which type of ores you are using uh, massively the kinetic, uh, kinetic reduction. This is just uh, because we do all this, not just with pellets and single crystals, but also with classical fine ores, because I think the future is much more in the field of fine ores to get rid of this expensive pellet process. And we just do a standard little analysis here through the 
chemistry of some of these fine ores. We get them directly from the providers in Brazil, in this case, and from Australia. You see uh, the manganese distribution, the calcium distribution, and so on, to get later a feeling what kind of oxides you could expect when you do you know, fluidized bed reactors today, or when you subject them to, to pellet manufacturing, to get a better feeling what kind of thermodynamic and kinetic databases you would have to consider to make this, you know, um, to subject this to simulation in the future. Let me go to the next uh, one of the many next opportunities, and that is uh, currently one of my favorites. It's, it's plasma reduction, and you all know that. You all have seen these wonderful gigantic furnaces where we currently do mostly our stainless steels here in Europe, but also of course commodity steels. You have these, uh, you know, more than 100 ton furnaces around. You have typically them equipped with gigantic graphite electrodes. But my point is. When you equip that with a slightly reducing atmosphere from, from, for instance, hydrogen, then you can kind of throw everything in and have something like a thermomix, you know, like a thermomix in, in, in your kitchen, but just for steel. So you try to condense the entire steel factory into one plasma aggregate. Here, this is one of our reactors where we do that, where you can do also spectrometry, where you can crack the plasma in its motion. You can study how the chemistry would affect the, the plasma reaction, the plasma intensity, the species that we produce. We are only uh, in the beginning. We don't, we don't do any theory here, but this is about to come that you better track what kind of um, you know, recombination and reaction kinetics do you have, which active species do you find, and so on. So that is very interesting and gives us a surprisingly fast reduction rate. So when we just use 10% hydrogen, the rest is argon, and we do uh, you know, a staggered sequence, we just uh, expose it one minute to this environment, reduction environment in a plasma furnace, usually now with a tungsten electrode, stop the process, take the sample out, uh, replenish the gas and do the second set and so on. So we, we have interrupted tests. And after 15 uh, minutes, you have, you have pure iron in your hand and you get these beautiful and complex microstructures on the way towards a reduction. Uh, this is all work from uh, Isnaidi, Susa, Philo, and Jan Ma, and a couple of other colleagues who work intensely on this plasma reaction. I think that's only about to start, and we have many ideas how to develop that further, and it's very efficient. And again, here we go down, if we have to, to the atomic scale, we see here in the plasma reduction a very important influence of silicon that breaks down after you form the first uh, iron nuclei, uh, breaks down the further reduction. A little side project just to share it with you because it's really fun uh, is just burning uh, using metals as a fuel. Uh, and that is very much related to these redox cycles, right? We do essentially the same thing like producing and oxidizing materials, we burn it. And the energy density, as you know, for metals is of course much, much higher than for hydrogen or for lithium batteries, which are actually not very, not very good. And that means the idea is that you combust metal powders, like here iron, and we study then again the microstructure, what happens during that combustion, and then you re-oxidize and uh, re reduce them again in a, for instance, uh, you know, hydrogen reducing atmosphere. So just as a little sidestep, uh, this field is much broader. Now, a few slides before I come to the end about aluminum. We know the secondary production of aluminum is much, much cheaper due to the low melting point than the primary production of aluminum that you all know is very expensive because of this enormous entropy of aluminum with, this, uh, with oxygen. And then you have considered the same parameters like how much scrap is around that cannot be entirely circular because the aluminum market is growing, scrap sorting and so on. And very important for aluminum as opposed to many of the commodity steels is that you cannot mix that. That is one of the big boundary conditions for, for aluminum alloy design. We have the cast blocks with very high silicon content. They will come back from the auto market and we don't really know what to do with it. We have the high iron content of the mixed scrap where we don't have a good recipe either. That must at some point enter into 6,000 alloys. And we have, of course, aerospace alloys that you can also not mix so well. This is a little uh, fun example um, that was done by a Humboldt fellow, by Lola Lindenstein uh, from France in, in our lab uh, a year ago or so, where she just started to look a little bit into uh, packaging material and see how many um, elements you already find in a today's commodity packaging aluminum material uh, tramping or intruding over time uh, due to scrap recycling. And that is uh, often very harmless. And here, of course, a little bit exaggerated by making these spheres much, much bigger, but only makes us sensitive that in the future, you must consider not only these, you know, 
currently very, uh, you know, um, fancy phase diagrams for high entropy alloys where we have massive alloying. But I think for the future, it's much more important to understand phase diagrams with 15 or 20 elements, uh, just in smaller quantities. That means particularly for aluminum, we must have a much better thermodynamic kinetic description of the formation of intermetallics that can be harmful or which we can modify to make them harmless when things enter through the square. So I think we, we know we are using too many elements in too many alloys. And that is a little picture from a paper of all that I've taken here to show that the current trend goes into really using a number of uh, high number of principal elements that make alloys very, very expensive. And maybe I sometimes contemplate about this and, and think maybe we have a little bit forgotten our roots as material scientists, because in the first place, we are good at thermodynamics and at microstructure. And microstructure is not like mass and energy conserved. It's not conserved. That means you can rejuvenate it. You can modify and tune it by processing. That is a big strength of our field. So it's just a little fly through, through an ordinary, you know, politic microstructure that all of us know, where you can, as you know, for a politic wire, you can achieve something like seven gigapascal strength. But back to aluminum, when you plot this now as a main trend uh, for the, the aluminum families, then we know from 1,000 and 3,000 packaging materials towards uh, 6,000 hang-on parts for cars and so on, towards the five and 7,000 higher strength commodity materials and towards the latest state of the art, like 70, 75 uh, alloys uh, with, uh, blended with uh, zinc, uh, copper and magnesium. You see, you have, of course, a very strong dependence on the composition, but the main point, we should not forget the big range, as you see here highlighted, that can indeed be influenced by the microstructure. So that gives you a lot of uh, tuning opportunities by processing. That means maybe we have to go back a little bit to using less chemistry and using more uh, smart microstructures. That is one of the messages that we can also pursue. When I try to cast this a little bit into kind of an overview diagram between potential for impact versus technology readiness, that, that would tell me we have a couple of, you know, uh, important fields, like I emphasized already, corrosion, uh, better scrap sorting, better less scrap production, catalyst, using electrical energy uh, in the industry and so on that are closer to the market, but have a very high leverage. Um, while on the other hand, we see with, a, I think, very high future impact, we have all processes that have primary avoidance of CO2 by all kinds of, of reductant agents. Uh, where plasma is just one of them within alloy family recycling, much better sorting, which will also start to be, become relevant for steels. And I think these high leverage and high risk fields offer so much of basic research, which, as I said in the beginning, even a small improvement has a massive uh, effect uh, because simply these quantities of iron, aluminum, and copper, and so on are so gigantic, also in the future, lithium and cobalt, uh, that whatever we find out will help, I think reducing these enormous CO2 and energy burns a little bit. Uh, and that affects not only greenhouse gas emissions, but also toxic materials, gas elements. But I focus today a little bit about uh, on, on iron and, and aluminum industry, uh, just to have a chance to show you also some of our latest uh, results here. So thank you very much that you bear with me and I would be happy to take some questions. Thank you very much.